on San Francisco Bay. My name's John, I'm your captain. Roger's playing deckhand today. Probably the most important safety feature of the boat is to know your crew, because in an emergency, we're gonna be the ones helping you guys out, answering your questions, and telling you what's going on. So again, my name's John. I'll be driving the whole time up here narrating, and Roger will be on the back deck. Now, safety equipment aboard the Amigo here. Life jackets are located inside the benches back there. The first two benches closest to the cabin have over 60 life jackets in there, more than enough for everybody on the boat. The life raft is in the very front of the boat. The big white container folks are leaning against, and it automatically inflates in case of an emergency. We've never had to use any of this equipment in an emergency, but regardless, we're required to tell you where it's at. We're happy to do so. All right, now the main safety rule we have aboard the Amigo, listen up. You're not stuck in your seats. I repeat. I repeat, you're not stuck in your seats. You guys can stand up and walk around the whole time. Hold on to the railings, but please never stand on any of the benches or chairs. Not even for a quick photograph. We're real strict about this. That's the most likely incident we would have is somebody falling down and getting hurt on the boat. So be real careful. There's a restroom in the back of the cabin there, Mark Head. Feel free to use that. Okay, with all that safety stuff covered, let's go ahead and start the tour. On our right-hand side, the big concrete building you can see with all these traps and plastic bins stacked around it. This is Fisherman's Wharf, the real Fisherman's Wharf. Not the coffee shops, candy stores, and t-shirt shops, but the real thing. Now, these boats, like the ones on our left, the Edward Letter, the Genesis, the Mary Beth, the Ocean Crystal, they all go out and make their day's catch. The seafood that they catch is then unloaded right here at these warehouses with these hoists. It's processed and shipped all over the world. Now, some of the seafood gets shipped as close as a couple hundred yards away to restaurants like Skoma's. We highly recommend Skoma's. It's a fantastic restaurant. We just passed it up. It's behind us. But as much as we recommend a particular restaurant, we like to recommend that you try what's fresh, locally caught and in season and right now that's halibut california halibut season has been in full swing for a while and the boats are going out there catching that delicious white meat fish very tender good for fish and chips or sauteing lots of good recipes at skomas with it order the halibut or get it at the grocery store warning as we do get ready to cruise out into San Francisco Bay there's a little bit of afternoon breeze for the sailboats but sometimes causes it to be a little bit bumpy for us I'll do my very best to keep the boat as stable as possible we're gonna go real slow even if it makes it an hour and five minute tour just so you guys don't get too wet and chilly if you do get cold you can move to a warmer spot on the boat or if you get too warm you can move to a cooler spot that's uh, pretty much wherever you want to go well, kick back, relax, enjoy the ride, and welcome to San Francisco Bay.
and straight to our left now, you can see the street that goes up between the high-rises there. That's Hyde Street. Now, Hyde Street is one of our classic cable car streets. If you want to catch that classic cable car, like you see on all the TV shows, movies, postcards, coffee cups, you name it, we're famous for them here. One block up the ladder to the right when we tie up. Now, that cable car line at Hyde Street goes up and over that hill. That hill is Russian Hill, and it drops down the other side to Union Square in Chinatown for shopping and dining. Costs a few dollars to ride and runs till about 10 o'clock at night. And if you have to wait in line, sometimes you can just walk up and have your picture taken in front of it. Say you were on the cable car right here on the waterfront. They no longer make that world-famous chocolate here in San Francisco. We moved the chocolate factory to San Leandro in the East Bay. We still sell it here, though. So please don't ever get yourself some chocolate. And maybe go for a stroll on Muni Pier or a swim in Aquatic Park. have their studio spaces at Fort Mason, gallery showings of their work, the big art supply house, a couple of restaurants, a bakery, a coffee shop, and on the weekends like today they do a farmer's market in the parking lot, and then every Friday night they do this off the grid event, a gourmet catering truck food fair with live music, lights, set up tables, right there in the parking lot, Fort Mason Center. The sailboats you can see over here, this is the marina, and the houses just past the sailboats, that's called the marina district. These are yacht clubs on the end of the break wall. on our left now the beach area we're going by this is Chrissy Field and it's just one small part of this whole area off to our left that's known as San
45 minutes or so will be the bumpiest part of the trip. As we get closer and closer to the Pacific Ocean, we'll never be in the ocean on this tour. You have to go all the way past the point of land in the distance there with the lighthouse. That's Point Bonita, Point Bonita Lighthouse, and that marks the entrance or exit to San Francisco Bay, depending on which way you're going. But we will feel a little bit of that ocean influence and the wind as we get closer to the bridge, so hold on. Once we turn and head down the tracks, uh, it smooths out because we're going with the wind. All a matter of perspective. Yeah, that was a good one. Up ahead of us, the Golden Gate Bridge. Now this is called the Golden Gate Bridge not because of its color, but because of the area of water that it spans. This is the gateway to the gold country. A full 80 years before this bridge was built, gold was discovered in Central California. Underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. That's right, most people who live here have never been underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. But almost everybody that lives here has been over it. Some commute over it twice a day to go to and from work. We definitely recommend the over the bridge trip now that you're going under it. Originally it was 25 cents to cross it in a car. And the bridge company, when they built it, said that they would eliminate the toll and make it free to drive across once it was completely paid for. Well, the bridge has been paid for many, many times over, and yet there's still a toll. It's over $8, and it keeps going up. There's rumor it's going to go to 10 here pretty soon. The reason for that, well, they're greedy. That, and they didn't count on how much it was going to cost to maintain this thing. To give you an idea, there's still a crew of 27 full-time painters employees. They paint this bridge from end to end. It takes them all year long, sandblasting and painting. They get to one end and they start all over again, a never-ending job. International orange is the color they choose. Looks more like a rusty red color to me, but whatever they say. They've estimated it takes over 25 years to completely paint the bridge, and over 110,000 gallons of paint are needed. Well, that, that's not on my to-do list. On each end of the Golden Gate Bridge, there were Civil War forts. That red brick building now behind us, under the archway, is Fort Winfield Scott, commonly known as Fort Point. Fort Point had over a hundred cannons there. It was capable of protecting the entrance of the bay with cannonball fire. Never used in any battles, but just in case. And then all the troops, all the ammunition, and all the supplies were kept ahead of us on the north side of the Golden Gate. That's Fort Baker. Fort Baker is a Coast Guard search and rescue station today. But originally, that's where the barracks. Both of these spots on each end of the bridge are great to pull off in your car to get photographs of the bridge. Plenty of parking. Now, we definitely recommend the over-the-bridge trip now that you've gone under it. It's free to walk and bike ride across, but bring your sweatshirts and your tennis shoes. The roadway is 225 feet off the water in the center. So the wind doesn't stop until it hits you. Oh, lots of harbor porpoise in the water. Keep your eyes open, you'll see a lot of stuff in the water here. Seal and harbor porpoise and a lot of bird life. Also bring your tennis shoes. It's a three mile round trip if you're gonna walk it. A mile and a half each way. It's free to walk and bike across. All right, if you need photographs, Roger's great at working all those.
Alcatraz the Rock. Now, Alcatraz was named by the Spanish when they first sailed into Sanford, named for the seabirds that inhabited the island and still do. In fact, this entire side of the island that faces the Golden Gate Bridge is considered a seabird sanctuary with cormorants, terns, pelicans, and seagulls living and nesting out here, and many other birds visiting. It remained nothing but the seabirds island in name until about the mid-1800s. And then Alcatraz became part of California and California part of the United States. We immediately dynamited the top of the island at that point, creating a big flat platform and brought some cannons out here and turned it into a Civil War fort. Much like the other forts I mentioned to protect the center of the bay here with cannonball for 30 years. And then in 1963, the government decided it was no longer economically viable to have a prison on an island. They shut it down. It was costing too much to maintain and run, and prisons on shore were proving to be just as secure. They closed it down, brought the prisoners to prisons on shore, and lay vacant for six years until 1969. And then in 1969, a group of Native Americans, Indians, took over the island. They claimed it as Indian land. They were going to turn it into a reservation of sorts, a cultural center, a learning center. It was a great idea. Unfortunately, though, a few bad seeds in the group started to burn and vandalize some of the structures. They started a couple of fires out here. When they did, the police boats and the Coast Guard boats were ordered to haul all the Indians off the island. Alcatraz lay vacant again until 1972. That's when the Park Service took it over and brought on. It's now San Francisco's top tourist attraction. They let about 5,000 people a day come out here and it books up way in advance. If you guys have tried to get tickets, you know what a tough ticket it is to get. Weeks in advance to get out to Alcatraz. The next best thing is to go around the island on a tour like this to tell you about the history like we did and then point out some of the buildings. So let's do that. That four-story building on the end of the island, that was the carpentry shop. If you were a prisoner on the island, you could have a job or chore to do on the island. And the carpentry shop was one of them, building furniture, perhaps, for military bases or the prisons. And that got you out of your cell a little bit more. It was definitely a benefit. The main cell block at the top of the island had 360 individuals. Maximum occupancy was only of about 275 inmates. Other jobs you could do. All got you out of your cell a little bit more. The smokestack behind us was the power generating plant. There's still diesel generators that power up the island in there. The three story building that says Indians land on it with the island's big correct area. The building to our right without a roof. That was the wreck area for the employees on the island. Seventy guards and their family. They lived in the four-story building up ahead of us, next to the dock. The kids would go to school on the island. So they were just school age. And a boat would go to every morning and every evening back home. Otherwise, they were stuck out here. Like I said, they hung out in that building. Without the roof behind us, it was burned down during the Indian occupation. That's the Sally Port. The Sally Port's a fancy name for a heavily fortified gate. A drawbridge would lower down, and it's how you got on and off the island. That's the oldest building still standing on Alcatraz from the Civil War era. And then up by the lighthouse, that's where the warden lived, the head of the island. It was said by the warden that they kept the prisoners on Alcatraz very well fed. They never let them take cold showers. They did a bunch of other stuff to try to keep them from escaping. Never wanting them to get accustomed to this cold bay water or be in good shape to be able to make the swim. But in spite of that, there were still 30 prisoners involved in 17 different attempts to break off the island. Seven were shot and killed, a couple drowned, and all the rest were recaptured. However, in 1962, a few years before Alcatraz closed as a prison, and probably part of the reason why it did, Frank Morris and the Anglin Brothers, a group of three prisoners using spoons from the cafeteria, slowly chipped away at their soft concrete cell block walls. It took them months to do, but eventually they made holes large enough to climb out of. 
They all got together, entered the water the same evening, swam behind us now to Angel Island about a mile and a half away. They were never seen again. They know they went in that direction because they found some of their belongings over there, but they never did find the prisoners. The warden at the time insisted that they drowned and that their bodies just never washed up on shore. Pretty unlikely though that one, if not all three of the bodies would not have eventually washed up. More likely they did make it off the island. You might have seen the movie Escape from Alcatraz based on their story. If not, tonight's a great night to rent that one and check it out. The Frank Morris and England Brothers story. Well, I know we covered a great deal about Alcatraz. In a short period of time, that's bound to happen on our one-hour cruise. So if you have questions, feel free to ask. Roger knows a lot about the history as well. And we'll keep telling you about stuff as we slowly cruise back towards Fisherman's Wharf and the waterfront. But here's a warning, guys. we got a wind coming from the Golden Gate Bridge. That's our right-hand side, and it's going to blow your hats and scarves off. And once they hit the water, they're gone. So definitely hold on to your hats. Maybe put them away, your scarves, your small children, anything. Pier 39 or anywhere else. Now these are sea lions, not seals. You saw some seals earlier on in the tour, much smaller, usually in the water, not on the docks. The sea lions, they're much happier on the docks and on land. And so they haul out like this. They bark. These are the ones that we're famous for. They bark. Everybody bark like a sea lion. <laughs> We're also going to get a really good view of a lot of the old boats here. Get right down the center of the ferry boat you're reading it to our left. And that's what this pier was built for. Also, this is a real important boat at the end of the sea lines are the Alma. These are hay scouts. Okay, folks, that pretty much concludes our tour. We sure hope you enjoyed it. Now, if you enjoyed the narration, uh, but I'll tell you especially Roger's help, answering your questions, taking pictures of your group, cracking jokes, making sure you guys are safe, feel free to give them a tip as you're getting off the boat. The deckhands on these boats, like Roger, well, we're mostly salmon fishing, but salmon season's closed. We shut our salmon season down, a lack of rain in the last five years. So, we're filling in, doing whatever we can, especially Roger whale watching tours. Every little bit helps pay the rent. If you have any further questions for Roger, places to go, things to see, feel free to ask those questions as well. Please watch your hands, fingers, and elbows on the railings as we get ready to slide into the harbor. We do come up against the pilings just like when we left. Also, do not get off the boat till we get it all tied up. One of us will climb up the ladder first and then help you guys at the top and the bottom. Thanks for joining us on the Amigo. Have a great weekend.
Just did that on that boat there. I can't recommend that highly enough. 20 bucks, it's a little over an hour long. There's a couple of them out there, but this guy has an awesome time. You can also catch your ahead of time deep sea fishing, fishing boats in general over here. But yeah, highly recommend it. It's right uh, up the road from Pier 39. So check it out. Thanks for watching my videos. Hit like, subscribe. I'll have more videos coming.